Hello and welcome to today's Center for Healthcare Strategies webinar made possible by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation on implementing trauma-informed care into organizational culture and practice. This webinar is the second of a series on putting trauma-informed care into practice. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly go over a few logistics. To eliminate background noise, phone lines are being muted during today's event. There will be a moderated question and answer session following each of the presentations. You may submit a question online anytime by clicking the Q&A icon located in the drop-down menu of the toolbar at the top of your screen. Instructions are shown on your screen at this time. Today's event will be recorded and shared publicly on chcs.org. At the end of the webinar, we ask that you please complete a brief online evaluation that will pop up on your screen. Your feedback is very important to us, and we hope that you'll take a moment to do this. I'll now turn the webinar over to Christopher Menchner, Senior Program Officer at the Center for Healthcare Strategies. Thanks, Travis. Good afternoon, everyone. As Travis mentioned, my name is Chris Menchner, and I have the privilege of serving as the Deputy Director of CHCS's Advancing Trauma-Informed Care Initiative. We're delighted to welcome you to today's webinar, the second in a two-part series on implementing practical strategies for trauma-informed care at the primary care, as well as the health system and organizational level. The webinar series is made possible by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is supporting CHCS's work in advancing trauma-informed care. This national initiative is aimed at understanding how trauma-informed approaches can be practically implemented across the healthcare sector. We're working with six demonstration sites in diverse care settings across the country to develop capacity and best practices for delivering trauma-informed care. The sites include the Center for Youth Wellness in San Francisco, the Greater Newark Healthcare Coalition in Newark, New Jersey, the Montefiore Medical Group in the Bronx, New York, the San Francisco Department of Public Health, the Stephen and Sandra Scheller 11th Street Family Health Services in Philadelphia, and the Women's HIV Program at the University of California, San Francisco. Today we'll hear from two of our advancing trauma-informed care sites. The first I'll go over the objectives for today's webinar, and I'll give a brief overview on a trauma-informed approach. Our hope is that by participating in today's webinar, you'll learn how two large health systems are implementing trauma-informed organizational practices to better support their staffs and improve the services they provide to patients and families, and that you'll come away with practical ideas on how to implement a trauma-informed approach in your own care settings and health systems. Trauma-informed care takes the patient's experience of trauma into account and changes the question from what's wrong with you to what happened to you. Trauma-informed care helps to build both patient and staff resilience and should include both clinical and organizational components. From the security guard at the front door to the receptionist to clinicians, all staff members should be involved in trauma-informed care efforts. Through interviews with leading trauma-informed care experts across the country and our work with the Advancing Trauma-Informed Care demonstration sites, we've identified key organizational and clinical ingredients that ideally must be in place to provide trauma-informed care. The first webinar in our series, held back on October 16th, focused on trauma-informed care in primary, setting, primary care settings, excuse me, and it also focused more on the key clinical ingredients. As you might have gathered, today's webinar will focus more on the key organizational ingredients. Today we'll hear from speakers who lead two of our advancing trauma-informed care demonstration sites. Dr. Rahil Briggs is the director of the Healthy Steps Initiative and Pediatric Behavioral Health Services at Montefiore Medical Group. Since 2005, her work in Montefiore has focused on bringing together mental health specialists with primary care providers to focus on prevention, early childhood mental health and development, as well as parent-child relationships. Dr. Ken Epstein is the Director of Children, Youth, and Family System of Care at the San Francisco Department of Public Health. Dr. Epstein is also responsible for the vision and implementation of the Trauma-Informed Systems Initiative, which is aimed at transforming SFDPH into a healing organization which we'll hear him talk about today. At this point, I'll turn it over to Dr. Ken Epstein. Good morning or good afternoon where you are. Um, it's an honor to be here and thanks, Chris, for the introduction. I just wanna give a little bit of context for the Department of Public Health in San Francisco. We're an integrated health department, uh, ambulatory care, trauma hospital, rehabilitation hospital, behavioral health, and population health as well as all other services for the city. We're a department of 9,000 people, and um, I've been here for 
a bit over five years. Um, a little bit more context, just so as you are listening to what I say, you know who I am, or a little bit. I'm a white, Jewish, heterosexual male working in the Department of Public Health in San Francisco. San Francisco is a city where the face of prosperity looks more like me every day and less um, and the face of poverty is more pronounced every day as um, black and brown folks in our city struggle to keep up with the prosperity. When I look out my window, we serve, the folks we serve do not reflect my race, background, and culture. So as a leader, um, that requires uh, intentionality about how I go about my job each and every day. I'm letting you know this so that you know that um, the space I come from and the potential biases I hold as you listen to this conversation. And also it's important to keep in mind that um, what I'll be presenting is the opinions of and the biases of uh, the work we're doing. This is important because um, our field, as our field relies on uh, a belief in objective truths, there's an under-reliance on the belief that relationships heal and relationships are subjective and ever-changing. So today, I'm gonna to talk to you about trauma-informed systems, which is really about how do you translate trauma to the delivery system and is really about how do you develop a relational healing organization. I'll tell you in brief how we got to this, what our change strategy is, what it is and how we're doing it, and some of the stories of success, as well as many of our challenges. So here's a bit about our vision. Um, Trauma-informed systems, principles, and practices um, ideally will support a place of, react of uh, reflection in place of reaction, curiosity in lieu of numbing, self-care instead of self-sacrifice, and collective impact rather than siloed structures. I wanna begin by talking about the importance of leadership and relational leadership. Um, I work for a bureaucracy, as many of you may as well, that left alone can and will be dehumanizing. So when left alone, if leadership does not take a relational stance about how we um, treat not only our employees, but most importantly, our clients, our patients, our families, and our children, we will operate in a system that will ultimately dehumanize and not deal with the importance of what's happening for the folks that are living and working in our city. In, in previous presentations, I know you've heard and you may be um, familiar with um, the ways in which trauma contributes and are public health issues. When I started here five and a half years ago, I spoke to the Director of Health, Dr. Director Garcia, about my experience in the field in the last 35 years. I told her, as, as many of us now need to know, that while um, there are many, many great advances in evidence and the work we're doing, that there was a terrific problem that we were facing, whereas there was great attention to the development of evidence and very little attention to the ways in which our organizations function in terms of delivering practices. And then in fact, our organization had spent millions and millions of dollars of importing practices from other places that at this point you could not track or be able to understand how or where they've been delivered. And most importantly, the communities that we were most concerned about we're not improving in the ways that we might want or desire relative to our mission. The health disparities were stable or getting worse. And as you can see on this slide, and as we may know that um, stress and trauma are linked to um, six leading causes of death, heart disease, cancer, lung element, ailments, accidents, cirrhosis of the liver, and suicide. And it impacts more than just the individual. It impacts communities, families, um, and whole systems. And it disproportionately affects our population. So when you have racism and urban poverty and trauma, it actually equals a toxicity that lowers the, um, the life expectancy of whole populations. In our city, which is seven by seven, you could go by street name and understand the, the average length of um, their lives may be different in 25 years. 
And uh, so we need a systemic and preventive approach. So trauma, we understood for many years, affects clients, um, and we know that it affects families. Um, we know it affects communities. Um, we now, through work around insidious trauma and um, vicarious trauma, understand that our staff, our organizations, our administrations, and even government are impacted by the, the impact of trauma. In San Francisco, um, maybe this is familiar to all of you where you are, I consider our city a city of initiatives on steroids. And why I say that is that um, our staff and our delivery system is constantly um, dealing with new initiatives, either coming from the federal government or the state, but most often from the city or from our departments ourselves as we're trying to change the way we do things and change what happens without looking at the underlying causes in our organization. What you see in our organization is that, um, not unlike the community, um, we experience the impacts of racism. So when you look at our um, demographics and our workforce, you see that there are, um, prom that folks of color, black and brown folks are not promoted at the same uh, degree as other folks in our system. You see that there are higher levels of discipline, more stress, um, the same kinds of experiences that are happening in the community we serve. So ultimately, if you have a delivery system that's reflecting the kinds of experiences our community experiences, it's very hard for that, that delivery system to deliver practices that um, will be effective for the community. You may recognize some of these, um, you may recognize some of these uh, symptoms of uh, uh, a traumatized system, there's not enough time for collaboration. My staff often tell me that there's just not enough time to do what they need to do, that there's a cycle of budget cuts and there's an expectation of budget cuts, that there's always tension between um, what we perceive as the client's needs or what the clients tell us are their needs and an increasing um, need for efficiency, that uh, our technology and paperwork demands even as we um, go to electronic health records, many of our staff will tell us that, they've, that the requirements have increased, not decreased. And we're, at least here in California, we're under an increase, increasingly uh, environment where lawsuits and reforms are driving the, the work more and more. Our workers tell us when we survey them that they're feeling less safe, there's high levels of staff turnover, specifically in our nonprofits. And um, in, in the inner city, in some of our clinics, there's a high degree of uh, traumatic events, violence, suicide, and deaths. And all of this, um, we put together to define ourselves as a trauma-organized system. In a trauma-organized system, what you begin to see is that you have a reactive organizational structure where you have hyper-arousal, it's crisis driven. Um, you begin to hear people relive and retell stories. When I started here five and a half years ago, people would tell me stories um, that happened 10 or 15, 20 years ago that were still current and important for them. Um, there's enormous fragmentation or silos between departments. You hear language like, um, oh, I just hate that department, or you never can get anything from billing or you can't do anything with that person, or don't even go to them. Um, there's interpersonal conflicts, um, organizational dissociation uh, or numbing. Uh, I remember people telling me when I come here that um, sort of counting the days towards retirement is one of the things that we see as a, as a, as a structure of numbing. Um, and then as organizations are more trauma-inducing, you see greater degrees of authoritarian leadership. What's interesting about my experience as a civil servant, most of my experience before that was in nonprofits, is that I have never worked with a workforce that's more inspired, um, more diverse, uh, more mission-driven, and yet the factors that impede their ability to provide that mission are often embedded in the organizational structure and in the bureaucracy. For those of you that work in civil service, you know that when we say uh, we work for civil service or government, I often say when I'm flying on an airplane and I introduce myself as a civil servant, 
the reaction of the person next to me is never or often not um, so kind. And so our workforce experiences um, an external view of themselves which can be internalized to the workforce and then reinforced by day-to-day -day experiences. So this was the story I told um, the director of public health uh, when I started, um, and uh, I don't advise this because what she then said is, oh, we need to do something about it, and she assigned me the problem. But it turned out to be quite a gift. Uh, we then went and um, interviewed um, all of the experts, maybe some of you on the phone um, across the country, to look at who was doing what relative to organizational change by thinking about trauma-informed systems and how we can change our system from a trauma-inducing to a trauma-reducing system. We interviewed over 400 folks in the city, um, community members, workers, and other folks that had um, experience with our system, and we put together a training, which um, is our trauma-informed training, and the director of health uh, uh, mandated that that training would be given to 9,000 employees. Three and a half years later, we've now trained 5,000 of those employees. Um, the training is really about a shared language, developing a foundational understanding of trauma, and understanding the nature of trauma, and also understanding the importance of racial and other disparities that lead to insidious trauma. The whole workforce from clerk to psychiatrist to clinician to doctor has been trained. Uh, the other day there was an electrician in a training sitting next to a physician taking notes on uh, the neurobiology of the brain. The goal is, and I'll talk about this in a second, um, is leading towards a healing organization. This is the vision to be reflective and collaborative, develop a culture of learning uh, make meaning out of the past and be growth and orientation, growth in our orientation and relational. Thus, our organization would be not trauma-inducing, but trauma-reducing. So how it works is that we, um, once we interviewed everybody, looked across the country, we developed these six principles you're looking at now, and we teach the 101 training through, um, through these six principles. Um, it's a three and a half hour training. Um, mandatory for the entire staff. You can see comprehensive safety, collaboration, empowerment, resilience, and recovery, uh, cultural humility and responsiveness, trust and dependability, and trauma understanding. These are very similar to the SAMHSA principles and very similar to um, other principles across the country, but they were important to understand that these were principles that our workforce, our city, um, adapted to meet our needs. We knew that the train and pray method was not enough. And what I mean by the train and pray method, it's quite obvious that we often give people trainings and pray that they'll do something different. So even when we started, we knew that a three and a half hour training was not gonna change our workforce. Even though the data on the training is quite positive, we know that if leadership and if there weren't intervention strategies from there, we would not be able to effectively implement. So we developed an organizational change model using uh, implementation science. I love this quote. Uh, it says it all about um, the, the problems we face in public sector implementation where we know that there are many tremendous practices, probably some that all of you are doing or that have created, that somehow do not make their way into the practice as usual environment. And the staff that I oversee each, each day are not able to implement effectively over time. Because if we don't, if we don't have effect, if we don't have a, um, if we use of effective interventions without implementation strategies, it's like a serum without a syringe. The cure is available, but the delivery system is not. So here you're looking at um, our model. It starts with, as we've learned, leadership engagement. When we surveyed our staff, I said we've trained about 5,000 people. When the data comes back from the training, uh, they say they like the content from clinician to clerk. Um, they say that it's a very important initiative. They give the training very high marks. And they also say it's likely we'll abandon it. And that's why you see at the top of this um, conceptual framework leadership engagement. Um, we call it leadership dating. 
we know that leadership um, uh, has more and more things they need to do, if not the least of which trying to catch up on their emails um, and other activities that are um, managing their time and pulling them away from uh, overall leadership. So we know that you have to engage leadership, and our workers tell us if they see their leaders in the trainings on their, on their smartphones, they know that they actually won't be doing anything. So we have a leadership engagement curriculum that we use, and it could be anywhere from 15 minutes to two hours to get leadership engaged and, and to be able to practice these principles. What you see next is the training I've been talking about, the trauma-informed training. It's a one-on-one -on -one training. It's delivered um, at all of our sites. And uh, we're, we'll, and it's a live training. It's not, uh, it's not on, ta it's not um, something we can do on the computer. What's most important, or I think, exciting about what we've done is not unlike other initiatives, we've embedded trainers so that we are not relying on any outside source to sustain this effort. Over the time since we started the training with one trainer um, four years ago. We now have 35 trainers in the Department of Public Health that have been trained and certified. And these folks are throughout our workforce. Some of them are clerks. Some of them are actual folks with lived experience or peers. Some of them are clinicians. They've been trained and certified, and they're delivering the training within their units and ultimately within our, um, our workforce um, when folks begin their practice here in, in civil service. We also then knew that we needed to have champions embedded in each of our units. So the directors with the middle managers uh, um, help choose champions. The champion's job, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a second, but the champion's job is to really work with um, quality improvement methodologies, plan, do, study, act, and begin to uh, implement strategies into the workforce that can change the culture of their workforce. Examples could be, um, could be putting up a whiteboard in the, in, the, in the lounge area, asking people if they want to do some mindfulness activities. Or they could be uh, developing a, um, a lunch walking experience or wellness activities. Or it could be changing our staff meetings so that the staff meeting is not um, left to uh, a number of business items but starts with some sort of grounding activity or gratitude activity. Uh, we are in the policy and practice. We're, we're uh, implementing this by tr attaching our principles to new policies, and we're evaluating the, um, the effort. I want to give you some specific examples and then some challenges. Um, you see in front of you our principles. Um, so each principle, I've offered you one example of something practical we're doing. On cultural humility and responsiveness, our director has um, hired um, Dr. Ken Hardy to work with our leadership and middle management to, to engage in um, very complex and difficult conversations about race in mixed groups um, across our organization. This has allowed us to begin to talk about race and cultural equity in ways that were otherwise um, we were unable to do, though they were happening in hallways and side conversations, but never uh, front and center. And it's allowed us to begin to um, engage each other around the, the hidden and the unspoken ways in which we trigger and or um, aggress against each other. Um, Around resiliency and recovery, um, with the help of our grant, we've now trained 30 champions in mindfulness, and we've trained two trainers as trainers so we can become a mindful organization by building mindfulness activities into our staff meetings and into our practices. As you remember, I talked about reactivity is a way of thinking about us becoming more reflective. Um, in terms of collaboration and empowerment, Many of our staff have been trained in participatory decision making. I don't know about the folks on the, fo on, on the webinar, but I know my experience in meetings often is that meetings start and end, and I'm not often sure about what decision has been made, what the decision rule was, who made the decision, and how the decision would be implemented. Participatory decision making trains both facilitators and participants about how to be in meetings 
more and more my experience is that meetings are either led by um, a few people that are speaking and many people may be catching up on their email, which I see as a form of dissociation. Compassion and dependability, uh, we have implemented reflective supervision. Many of our staff were not experiencing any supervision, and if they were experiencing supervision, um, the supervision was often around uh, compliance activities and not around their experiences of the work. Many of our workers are working directly in communities where there may be violence or, protected or directly with folks that have experienced violence, and the only way to combat the transferal or the trans, trans, transcommunication of those uh, experiences is by having some place to reflect and talk about what's going on. And then finally, I told you about the trauma understanding. That's our work with uh, TIS 101. Before I talk about evaluate and our evaluation, I just want to talk about challenges. There's an obvious challenge that we are a large um, siloed organization. Uh, when an initiative is set up like trauma-informed systems, it's often driven by the personalities of those that are most, um, most passionate about it. The biggest challenge is how do you sustain a practice like this that can be generational? We are not going to change the Department of Public Health, which has gotten this way over the last 50 years. Even though we do great practices and we have great folks, many of the bureaucratic structures that we're trying to change are embedded in our organizational culture, and they're passed from generation to generation. So the greatest challenge is how do you build a sustainable initiative that um, cannot be driven out by a budget cut or uh, a new idea? And I, I will say that one of, those, one of the greatest challenges of that is keeping the attention in a really constantly changing environment. Our strategy has been to not uh, rely on external people, but to build it into our culture and build it through an early adopter and using quality improvement strategies. Another great, great challenge for us has been uh, the, the capacity to spread. So some, some units are adopting at very fast rates and some other places that are not adopting at fast rates. So this takes um, the, the, the will of upper management to meet and think about how to continue to sell this to all of our employees and all of our leadership. The greatest challenge probably is um, evaluation. We, it's ultimately, when you do something like this, you want to do it knowing that you're going to change the experiences of our clients, our patients, our families, and children, and you want to be able to measure a direct result between an effort to train your staff in trauma-informed and relational practices and know that there would be practice change and ultimately changes in the, um, in the outcomes for our clients and our... So this is a very challenging way to evaluate because there are so many factors that could impact our, our clients and our children and our youth and our families. We have some practices, and what you're seeing in front of you is the three areas that our evaluation team are looking at. One is um, knowledge change. Are we supporting learning? And we're very clear uh, from all of our data that our staff are engaged and interested in the learning process. We know they like the training. We, do, we also, at the end of the training, do something called a commitment to change. And the commitment to change is a tool that we use that allows people to uh, commit themselves to some change, and we know that 80% of the people that go to the training have followed up and done something different. That's unusual from uh, around trainings. We have some stories of practice change. Um, we know that we have a lot of qualitative stories. We don't have a lot of quantitative evidence yet, though we're, we, we are um, evaluating that. For example, um, last week, uh, at Laguna Honda Hospital, which has implemented almost trained 100% of their staff, which is our rehabilitation hospital. One of the champions is, is in, works in housekeeping. And when asked how this initiative had changed her practice, she said to the group that she now understands differently when a patient she's working with is really grumpy 
that she used to respond quite negatively to them, and now she understands what's going on with them. Imagine what that might be like if um, the entire housekeeping department had that kind of um, thoughts about it. Or the, um, the clerk the other day that said um, she, now, um, she now looks up when she's, um, when somebody looks up from her computer when a patient is coming in so that she can, um, and she said that's just changed the way in which she relates to the folks that come into the office. Another quote just for somebody said is, I thought the training would open up things for me in my work life, but really it's opened up doors inside for me myself. And that speaks to how we're changing the experiences of our staff, understanding what's happening for them. And a preschool, at a preschool um, with, that worked with this model with teachers, understood the importance of transition, teaching teachers about transitions found that the transitions went better, parents stayed longer, and the kids cried less. And we have multitude of stories like that. And ultimately, we want to know that there's systems change, that, our, uh, that the kinds of things that we do day-to-day um, -day in our system that can dehumanize our staff um, have a more humanizing and more relational and a more reflective practice. Overall, uh, we, we have trained outside of San Francisco, we've now trained 5,000 other people uh, in different organizations, in schools, uh, in, uh, in probation, in child welfare, and other organizations, nonprofit organizations. And we're very proud that the city of San Francisco is now looking at becoming a trauma-informed city and training all civil service and, and CBO and, and, and nonprofit employees in trauma-informed systems. So I really appreciate the time to tell you about our work, and uh, I'm open for any questions. Thanks very much, Ken. We really appreciate you sharing the important work that you and your team are doing at SFDPH. Um, so at this point, we'll hold a 15-minute question and answer session with Ken before we turn it over to our next presenter. As you can see there, the instructions for submitting a question are up on your screen. So we'll start off with asking Ken about um, how do you reinforce the training in staff's everyday work life after the initial training ends? And Ken, if you could touch on the role of staff champions in those efforts, that would be great. Sure. Well, thanks, Chris, for that question. Um, the, the truth is, is that if we can't, I'll say the opposite, if we can't reinforce it, it will go away and that's what the staff tells us in their evaluations. There are three ways we're reinforcing day-to-day. -day. One is we are um, incorporating day-to-day -day activities. Uh, we're just beginning to do huddles and early adopting um, organizations where champion staff and middle managers huddle every day or three times a week or twice a week to talk about what they, what they can do today, what they can do today to help reinforce and encourage a more relational and healing environment so that it takes place each day. In all of our meetings, we've changed the beginnings of our meetings. Uh, we either start with one of our principles and an activity around principles. That might include something like um, a gratitude exercise where the staff, and these take, and these, I should say these take two or three minutes with the staff either in pairs if it's a large meeting or small groups or if it's a smaller meeting together, say something they have some gratitude for. And we know that actually talking about gratitude changes our brain uh, chemistry. We know that that changes the way we experience the rest of the meeting and, and logs us into the meeting. We also are, um, we have um, visual aids um, in many of our sites uh, with the principles available so that we can uh, remind folks of the principles. We have a champion learning community. The champions that are um, volunteering uh, have some productivity reduction, and uh, they are participating in a learning community across different agencies to be able to learn practices from each other and implement those practices. We use a, um, an assessment tool that the champions deliver to their unit uh, that gets a work, it's, it's a trauma-informed work-life survey, and it tells them how their particular unit is doing relative to the six principles. For example, if 
um, they're doing great in collaboration, but they have some challenges around safety and stability. The champions and the leadership work on some internal things they can do to create more safety, both psychological and physical safety, and or things that need to be escalated to leadership to help them in those regards. So there's a constant feedback loop between the champions and leadership about how to improve the site. Ken, just a quick follow-up question. Um, someone asked, how do you identify uh, staff champions and leaders? Okay, I didn't mention in this, I'll tell you how not to. <laughs> um, we did it with, when, you know, these are one of our mistakes early on and we have plenty to report on. Early on when we did the trainings, we used to do um, open trainings, which we still do, meaning anybody can go to the trainings. We've moved much more to doing um, specific trainings for units so that units can train together. Early on, um, we would have the trainings and then we'd have a sign-up sheet and people would just sign up and say they were interested in being champions. However, in that group, we got folks that had not talked with their boss or their leader about it, and maybe they were being a champion for all the right reasons, or maybe they weren't being a champion for all the right reasons. But the group did not turn out to be the champions group that we needed. So we, in our leadership engagement, we will go work with leaders, we'll meet with staff meetings, we'll go to staff meetings, we'll give our, our talk, and then the leaders and the middle managers will um, pick um, and ask for volunteers and pick, and then there's an application process that the champions do to apply for and become very simple, but one in which gets them thinking about this as a role. And it's a very minimal amount of time they need to spend, so for those of you that are thinking, oh my God, this is like a whole nother job, it really only turns out to be uh, a once a month uh, learning community for them and then a day, you know, then some participation with their, their middle manager and, and leader in the site to help um, develop this. And a lot of the work is done in staff meetings. Thanks for that as well, Ken. Um, kind of taking a step back to the beginning of your efforts, uh, would you recommend that another organization uh, try and implement a trauma-informed approach, kind of take an, an, or, an, or, an organic approach to it as your organization did, or do you recommend uh, trying to implement an existing model? Chris, that's a really tough question. Uh, I think there are advantages and disadvantages of both. I think what's organic about our model, I mean, we, we learned from everybody across the country. We are um, indebted to Sandra Bloom and the sanctuary work that she did. We're indebted to Maine and Thrive. and you know, uh, work that happened in Florida and upstate New York and, um, and San Diego. So by no means did we invent something, and I would not encourage anybody to invent anything. We spoke with all folks across the country, local experts. I think what we did is we adapted it to our system. That was really important. And the second thing is we thought about how we could sustain it. What we, what we chose not to do was to spend I'm just making this up, but a million dollars on on a whole set that was going to come in and and um, and sort of implement something to us. The big thing is we we decided to implement um, from us and within us, believing that if it's from us and within us, it has a greater chance of sustainability. So, Chris, I think the answer is it, the adaptability is probably more of a process question. That was we built our own. Uh, delivery method and have built our own delivery method. A lot of the content, I'd say, we developed some of it, and um, a lot of it we um, helped. You know, other other you know great thinkers across the country develop. So I would do a amalgam of both. Great, thank you very much for that as well, Ken. Um, we've received a number of questions about your evaluation efforts. Um, if you could talk a little bit about your evaluation tool and specifically uh, whether or not it is standard, standardized or if it's developed locally. Mm -hmm. um, and folks are wondering how you measure commitment to change. So I'd say back to the last question, one of the challenges of being a Department of Public Health, and you know we were blessed with getting some grants, uh, including one from SAMHSA and um, a grant that um, uh, Chris and all represent of um, the Center for Healthcare Strategies and Robert Wood Johnson. 
and those have helped us develop some of our um, evaluation tools. So we're, very, we're not very well funded. We're not a university nor collaborating with the university, so we don't have the kinds of infrastructure. Our evaluation efforts have been led by um, Dr. Loomis, who um, um, it then takes on um, interns and postdocs and, um, and develops our evaluation work. So I just wanted to say it's slimly, um, slimly funded um, and um, very active. Relative to the commitment to change, uh, we, we um, took a tool and, um, that had been used in, um, I believe, in Maine um, and um, um, uh, altered it some, but, um, and we use that tool at every training. And what we do is for a percentage, I think it's 25% of the folks that come to the training, we follow up at three or six month intervals to see if they're following up on their commitment to changes. We've begun um, doing something around accountability partners. We didn't do this in the beginning. So when we ask people to make a commitment to change, we also ask them to have an accountability partner and exchange um, email or other information so they can check on each other. So that's our commitment to change. Our other evaluation um, tools that we're using, we're just developing, um, so I did say something about the life, I'm sorry, I did say something about the work-life um, survey. Uh, that is something that was developed in-house here, um, and it is being normed as we speak. I would say to the folks listening, there are many, many tools out there that are quite good. Um, our tool was built for our, our principles. It's, it's completely functioning around the principles that we developed, so it's aligned with what we're teaching which is why we choose to develop our own tool. In terms of practice, the way we're going about that is we're looking at our early adapters, uh, early adopters, and we're developing a, a, a model testing tool. Uh, so for example, Children, Youth, and Families, which I'm overseeing, um, serves about 3,500 children a year. We do have a standardized tool we use around their, um, their mental health outcomes. We did take a baseline uh, before we fully implemented, and we're going to be looking at the baseline in terms of our children, youth, children and youth outcomes over the period of time we're implementing to see if there are any changes, particularly in the trauma lens of their work, given many of our children and youth are experiencing great levels of trauma. Uh, so those are the main, and we have, we have the typical things, like we have satisfaction surveys that we're looking at, and. Um, other, you know, other tools around the, the implementation of the training. But I, what we're most interested now in is actually the impact of the organizational change. Thank you again, Ken. Um, I'd like to shift gears if we could for a second, and we just have time for one more question with you. Um, folks are wondering what resources are there to help organizations facilitate discussions about race and racism? And I think you touched on this a bit during your presentation. Um, these are very difficult things to approach, as we know. So if you could talk a little bit about the resources that you all have drawn on and the strategies that you've used to uh, introduce this part of your work, that would be great. Well, I want to start by saying I appreciate that question. Um, I want to start by saying that where we started, and this is not about our human resources department, it's about most human resources department, is that when we started, the feeling was that you could not talk about race at the workplace. And some of you may work in places where that has been the starting point. So one starting point is engaging your human resources department, uh, in particularly if you're in diverse settings and where you're experiencing the same kinds of tensions as we are in our workplace. So the first place would be, and the second place is, it really needs to be supported at the top. In our case, Director Garcia uh, completely supported our organization uh, engaging in a, um, in a dialogue that focused on uh, race and racial equ equity in our organization and outside our organization. I don't know how you could do it without the support of upper management. But the third thing is, in this case, where I spoke before about the department feeling that um, the, the, the approach we're using around trauma-informed systems being an internal approach and in training folks internal to our organization. 
we felt, and it was the right decision, that we needed um, an external expert in dialogue and conversation. These, were, these are not PowerPoint trainings. These are, for us, our leadership, this was three to four um, eight-hour days in cohorts of 30 people having really challenging and facilitated conversations about what we bring relative to our privilege, our subjectivity, and our uh, implicit bias to the workplace and how we work that out with each other and really engaging in how do we have difficult conversations with each other. So I wanted to say the approach we've took, has, taken has been a, quite an intensive approach and I um, could not say enough about its, um, its benefits for me as a leader and its benefits for my, um, my group of leadership where we've now developed a, um, that has turned into for us um, an equity plan, a racial equity plan that we as leadership, my leadership team of 20 folks, now have a measurable plan of how we can uh, ensure that we are continuing from what we learned in the dialogue, practical advances in our workplace as much as, you know, an example might be, do we have a similar set of questions around when we interview people um, and are our interview teams um, diverse enough and challenging enough to combat implicit bias in hiring? And we are, you know, so we have specific tasks that we developed around developing a set of questions and some answers, some parameters around answers that we agreed would, across our division, would uh, be satisfied um, in terms of trying. So that's an example of something we've done. Taking a difficult conversation, how to have this cohort working together as a group, and then translating it into practice. I don't know how we could have translated it into practice without doing the work we did um, on ourselves and our own, um, what we bring to the workplace. Thanks very much for that answer as well, Ken. And thank you again for your incredibly informative presentation. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Rahel Briggs, who will talk about strategies for addressing trauma through a health system based on experiences scaling a trauma-informed care framework across Montefiore Medical Group. Rahel, it's all yours. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Ken, it's always a uh, pleasure to listen to you talk about the work in San Francisco, and it's an honor to share the virtual stage with you. Um, as Chris mentioned, I work at Montefiore Medical Group, and I am here as a representative of really a, an awesome team that has been working on this trauma-informed care project for the last couple of years. Miguelina Herman is our project director, Brittany Gurney our project manager. We've had a wonderful content team made up of psychologists and social work leadership, and then a trauma-informed multidisciplinary team, which we call our TIMS team, um, that really spans nurses, pediatrician, family medicine doc, administrators, front desk folks, psychologists, and social workers, so I'm, I'm also honored to represent them. Um, for those of you who haven't spent a lot of time in the Bronx, um, let me just give you a little bit of a, just locate you. There are 62 counties in New York State, and the Bronx is one of them. We usually rank somewhere around 62nd on most health outcomes, whether they be obesity rates, asthma, diabetes. There is a congressional district in the South Bronx, which is the poorest urban congressional district in the country. Montefiore is the largest healthcare provider in the Bronx, and we have long been committed to social justice. It's in our mission statement, and it informs much of what we do. If you're gonna work in a place like the Bronx, it, it better. We have a big, huge hospital network of 11 hospitals or something. Where I sit is in the primary care setting, and that's where I'm gonna really speak from, you, uh, speak from today. Our primary care network comprises 21 practices, spread across the Bronx and actually lower Westchester County, just to our north. We take care of about 300,000 patients every year, and we do so with a staff that numbers in the thousands as well. 75% of our patients have Medicaid or Medicare. 
50% of our patients are Hispanic, 35% of our patients are African American or black. And the Bronx is now, in terms of the boroughs of New York City, often where new immigrants come first. And so depending on the, on the year, we might have a, a big influx of families from Bangladesh, say, or Albania. So an incredibly uh, diverse place where we work. I'm going to share with you today um, why we embarked on this journey and how we proceeded. And I'm really going to touch on four key elements. Number one, the importance of leadership buy-in, and I think Ken really eloquently described that just now. Number two, really the, the logistics, the, the how we did this with some learning collaboratives, some online learning modules, and some in-person trainings. We think it's a truism of adult learning that we learn best when we learn in multiple different venues. Um, some screening initiatives we did, primarily around introducing ACEs screening for those 300,000 patients, and then the development of a critical incident management team, which I will talk about as well. So the first thing I'd say in terms of the why, Montefiore and the medical group, this outpatient primary care network I'm speaking from, already had an integrated behavioral health service. We have a team of psychologists, psychiatrists, and social workers, about 80 folks who exist working alongside the physicians, nurses, and care teams, and provide integrated behavioral health to the families, the patients, right there within the primary care practice. And so you might say, well, you know, in the past, before we started this work with CHCS and Robert Wood Johnson, folks would say to me, well, are you guys a trauma-informed care system? Are you trauma-informed? And I find that such a funny question. Uh, well, hard to say. Short of, you know, doing the wonderful work that Ken mentioned, the sanctuary model from Sandy Bloom, who's trauma-informed? How do you decide, yep, we're trauma-informed? Is it because you all went to one weekend retreat? Is it because you have an integrated behavioral health service which treats trauma and assesses for trauma? Or is it something more comprehensive than that? And we decided it had to be more comprehensive than that. While our behavioral health staff were trauma-informed, they were treating trauma, they were very well versed in trauma, we knew that, for example, some of our security staff, our front desk staff, our nursing, and our physicians were not as trauma-informed. We knew we had to get leadership buy-in. That means identifying champions and, very importantly, aligning with institutional goals. I would echo what Ken said, that it's not just a, a question of asking for champion volunteers out there in the crowd. It's a multidisciplinary discussion about where are the champions, who are the champions. Maybe there are some folks who self-nominate, but that has to be confirmed by the behavioral health service providers in their system, by their nursing management, by their physician management, by some patients. We have a patient advisory committee. And so identifying champions is critical. The second really key piece, and I can't overstate this, and I think sometimes this, this gets lost in, in these discussions, is the importance of aligning with institutional goals. And what do I mean by that? Well, I already said Montefiore has social justice in our mission, but I mean it much more concretely than that. For example, as a healthcare institution, and hopefully a lot of you identify with this, many years ago we started working toward patient-centered medical home accreditation, or PCMH. And to be a PCMH level three place, you had to do all sorts of things. And, you know, deep down in there was some discussion of social determinants of health, right, in addition to working on diabetes and asthma and everything else. And I seized on that social determinants of health language and really said, isn't that trauma-informed care? And while they're not a perfect overlap, there's quite a lot of overlap. And I said, if we can do this trauma-informed care work and we do it well, then we are meeting both the spirit and the real meaning behind screening for and 
intervening with social determinants of health. So that's just a concrete example of what I mean by that. You're always trying to look at where your institution is going, what they've put out as their five-year plan, what, what are the things they want to really hit, and how can you align with that? And while it does, may not seem to be a perfect match at the outset, how can you make it really fit there? So I really want to, I want to emphasize that. So one of the ways that we aligned was that we already had these existing learning collaboratives. These were things that came out of our PCMH work in the years past, and it meant that four times a year, multidisciplinary teams from all 21 sites gathered together for a morning and early afternoon to learn together and learn from each other. And so we took advantage of that infrastructure and layered our trauma-informed care on top of it. The goals for 2016 and early 2017 that the patient-centered medical home team were focused on were about patient experience. Ding, ding, ding. It is not a long walk to get from patient experience to trauma-informed care, right? And so we used these already existing platforms to really deliver some of the main content. And what I'm going to do today is I'm the last um, speaker out of the four of us in this series is really try to almost take the, you know, 500, 600 of you out there on the phone and put you into these learning collaboratives. I'm going to do little mini two-minute teaching sessions, what, how we taught these and how we talked about this work to this to these tables of folks, there were hundreds of people in the room at every time, and they would really range. There would be a representative from the front desk, from nursing, from the provider, and from management. So let me, you know, transport you now into a nondescript hotel ballroom somewhere in the Bronx and pretend that it's April 2016 and we're really introducing trauma-informed care to our system. So we let everyone know we were going to be meeting together for these five learning collaboratives. And after the learning collaboratives, we were going to assign an online learning module to cover what we had discussed in the in-person meeting. Again, adult learning suggests repetition is good for you. And then the behavioral health staff at each site would do in-person trainings and they would do them sometimes in a role-specific way, so just meeting with the nurses around a topic, and sometimes for the whole practice. We told them we'd be evaluating this, and that we'd evaluate it using a standardized measure, the burnout, compassion, fatigue, and vicarious trauma assessment measure. We would also be asking our patients doing random blinded assessments of our patients, their experience of us as a trauma-informed care system, and we'd be assigning clinical vignettes to our learners, both pre and post their learning, to see if they might react any differently. So again, you're in the ballroom, and I might say to the whole group, all right, guys, what is this trauma-informed care? It's just really aiming to acknowledge how trauma affects our patients, their experiences at Montefiore, and how working with patients with trauma histories impacts our wellness, our wellness as a trauma-informed care provider system. We said our ultimate goal is shifting the way we think about our patients, their experiences, and really their behavior. Our ultimate goal is that we do our job well while staying well. And our ultimate goal, like Chris said in the beginning, is to change that reactionary question we might have in our head when people behave in certain ways, that question of what's wrong with you, to a question that really nurtures empathy and asking what happened to this person. And I'll be very honest with you, we introduced, we introduced some humor into these trainings. And you say, well, I don't really get it. How is trauma-informed care a humorous topic? It's not, and that's the point. It is so deep and so dark and so intense. We let folks know they might have some reactions to the things we were talking about, and they were free to get up, 
go get a glass of water, take a walk, and come back. And we let them know we would try to introduce some humor here and then to just lighten the mood. So we might say, just to be clear, everybody, these are questions we have in our head. You're not going to actually go around asking patients, what happened to you? We made it clear that we weren't asking them to treat trauma. That was the work of our well-trained behavioral health staff. And that really what we're trying to do is, regardless of our role, engage patients and each other from a trauma-informed care approach to be sensitive to, to engage patients, to aim to minimize re-victimization, to contribute to healing, recovery, and empowerment, and to emphasize in collaboration. Okay, so that's April 2016, and everybody's sharing the same framework. Then they do the online module. Then they get in-person follow-ups at their site. And that takes us to June 2016, our second learning collaborative, where we wanted to talk about manifestations of trauma. And so we might say, all right, guys, look at these two images. You've got an elephant able to remain focused and balanced in a pretty challenging situation, a stressor, compared to a person having the weight of the elephant on his back in a dark, less optimistic, and overwhelming picture. But both the ball and the person seem very unlikely to be able to stand up to the weight or the load of the elephant. But it's not the weight of the load, it's how the load is experienced. And when a stressor is perceived as unmanageable, the individual is reminded of other times when things were unmanageable and thoughts and feelings from the past are activated. So we might say in June of 2016 to all of our learners, when a patient shows up and they're 10 minutes late and you say, well, I don't know, I'm going to have to ask the doctor, I don't even know if he can see you now. You neglect to realize that that patient took two buses to get there and is perceiving your reaction as particularly stressful. It's reminding them of some other time when things were unmanageable. And it might give them some triggers, right? It might make them have some traumatic beliefs that, I'm not safe here, people want to hurt me. If I'm in trouble, no one will help, and the world is dangerous, right? We explained what triggers are. I think this word trigger is so universally used right now, and what does it really mean? It's a belief that an individual or a system, by the way, you can have a trauma-informed system and a traumatized system, beliefs that individuals or systems developed during stressful or traumatic events, and they are brought back to mind whenever new stress is perceived as unmanageable or overwhelming. Is it actually unmanageable or overwhelming? It almost doesn't matter. It's how it is perceived. We explain that people who have experienced trauma sometimes expect bad things to happen to them. They have difficulty managing or regulating their feelings. They might have a difficult time forming or maintaining healthy relationships. And something that was very fascinating, lest we think, oh, it's just our patients who experience trauma, <laughs> excuse me, you will not be surprised to know that it crossed our whole system. Some of our physicians had experienced such extraordinary traumas that hadn't been dealt with and really understood this. All right, fast forward. Now we're in the fall of 2016. We've made it to the third learning collaborative, so they've now had two, and they've had online modules after and in-person sessions. And we're talking about secondary trauma and compassion fatigue. We say over time, all these patient experiences start to exhaust us, and we start giving, and we're pushing, and without active and effective self-care techniques, which we're going to teach you today in the fall of 2016, we start to see an emotional and physical erosion that takes place. It becomes harder to have empathy, to have hope, to have compassion. We, the helpers, are unable to refuel, to regenerate. And it's the burnout that Ken was speaking about before, plus these trauma stories of patients 
and the inability to effectively refuel and regenerate, that's compassion fatigue. And it's the cost of caring. We said to them, secondary trauma is caused by exposure to trauma. You didn't experience the trauma, but you learned about it. You're not in danger, but you're learning about it. You're hearing a patient's story, you're debriefing with a colleague, and you might have secondary trauma symptoms that are similar to that of patients with experience of trauma. So you might have intrusive memories, you might have somatic symptoms, sleep disturbances, irritability, and other PTSD-like symptoms just from hearing about all of these trauma stories, not actually experiencing them yourself. And if any of you are physicians or work with physicians, you know this went down like a, like a load of bricks, right? Physicians like to think of themselves as just seeing trauma all day long and going home and everything is great and you separate it. But we know that's not totally possible, right? We know that there is such a thing as vicarious traumatization. We said it's not just the hard stories, the hard experience. You might even look at this picture of a full waiting room and become anxious, right? And with time, that burnout, that exposure to secondary trauma, stress, and compassion fatigue adds up. It's cumulative. And we become somewhat numb to doing this work, or others feel sad, or others feel quite angry at the unfairness of the world. And a lot of us just get totally overwhelmed and look at this picture and say, ah, it's a shift in our world view. Right? And if we're doing this job well but not staying well ourselves, this becomes vicarious traumatization. So then, now we're in the winter of 2016 and we start to teach how to respond. Right? And we teach them this PEARLS acronym. We didn't invent this. You guys have probably heard about this before. We really asked them to think about when patients are having a response and we think to ourselves, I wonder what happened to this person, we're going to focus on partnership, empathy, apology, respect, legitimization, and support. We brought in some humor, again, remember, and we said, guys, don't do this if you can't do it authentically, right? You know. Touch the heart, not just the ears. So you can say, oh, I'm sorry that happened to you, right? That's an apology. Or you can say, I'm really sorry that happened. We're going to thoughtfully respond versus just instinctively reacting. We taught them these three possible ways they might react when they are faced with secondary trauma-inducing situations. This is the work of my excellent colleague, Dana Crawford. And <clears throat> she first talks about the avoider, right? So what does the avoider do? They withdraw. You might refer that patient elsewhere, right? Oh, we can't, we don't have the right services for you. Why don't you go somewhere else? We silence patients. We do it with our body language. We ignore what the patient has said. We change the line of questions. We might use humor, not just as a positive way, but as a way to distract ourselves from our true experiences, right? So for an example, if a patient tells me about her assault in detail, I might avoid writing the note in the chart, right? I mean, that's the note that my, my manager is going to come, why don't you write this note, why don't you sign this note? No. I might be a little bit short with the patient and not ask a lot of follow-up questions. I might say, well, you seem fine, I don't need to see you next week, right? And that's the avoider. Or you might be the superhero in your response to trauma. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're a superhero because you know, we went into this work, we work at Montefiore in the Bronx, and we did it because there's a helper in us. But when that helper works harder than the patient is working, that's that exaggerated sense of responsibility, right? Excessive advocacy, oversharing, 
Maybe we're covering for our provider friend who's constantly late. They don't complete their forms, right? So we do it for them. Or that nurse who's constantly having conflicts with patients, but you cover and you rescue that nurse. That's that excessive advocacy, right? So an example, maybe a patient doesn't show up three times in a row, but they remind you of somebody. And so you call, you text, you mail a letter, you leave a message at the emergency contact, and you call again before you close the case, right? And finally, some people respond as the critic or moving against. This is pretty straightforward. There's anger, irritability, sarcastic remarks, over pathologizing, right? To change in your tone of voice, your body language. Maybe it's some sort of superiority, or maybe it's pursuing treatment goals without the client's consent. So we try to teach everybody these three possible ways that they might respond and help them to self-diagnose, really, what they were doing. And then finally, in our final learning collaborative, we moved into resilience, recovery, and the commitment to change, right? So we said, listen, how are we going to cope? How do we survive this work, right? And we taught them many solutions. Pearls that I already went through. Our organization instituted a CALM line. That's an actual phone number. You can call it yourself, 718-920-CALM. See what happens. We taught deep breathing. We did it in person. We walked everybody through deep breathing. Everybody thinks they know what deep breathing is, but we actually trained them. We trained on mindfulness. We asked each clinic to create a calm space, not just a staff lounge with the TV on and people running in and out, but a place where people could go and really do some deep breathing and mindfulness. We asked them to create walking routes. If they were in a neighborhood where it might not be safe to go out in the dark, can you do a walking route within the clinic that you map it out and you show it that it's a mile long? Who's your buddy? Do you know how to use the employee assistance program? and then the um, critical incident management that I talked about. So really quickly, I'm going to go through um, our trauma-informed care screening and the SIM team. So already with our behavioral health program, we screen for depression, we screen for autism, we screen for all sorts of things. And we had, through our Healthy Steps program, been screening for ACEs. <coughs> Excuse me. But it was just for our new families, and we wanted to move into screening for ACEs for everyone, even adults. We asked practices to really think, how do you can assess your readiness? And we created a readiness assessment for them to know whether they were ready to begin conducting PDSAs, that's, that's the, you know, quality improvement language, plan, do, study, act, to screen for ACEs. We asked them to let us know what kinds of training and support they would need to do this screening. We had a bunch of adult doctors saying to us, all right, we get it. Y'all, the pediatrician screen for ACEs, but how, we're screening adults for childhood ACEs, and how is that going to help? <clears throat> and we shared um, a story that Dr. Filetti, Vince Filetti, gave on ACEs where he talked about a patient with a high ACEs score who started smoking to self-medicate which increased the patient's odds of developing lung cancer and was really seen as a coping mechanism for childhood trauma. So if the PCP, if the primary care physician, the adult medicine doc, just tries to give some anti-smoking counseling, some patches, some quit lines, some gum, some discussions, but doesn't talk about trauma, it's not very effective. And we asked those doctors, we said, raise your, you know, think to yourself, raise your hand. Have you had patients who've smoked for years despite your repeated counseling on the risks involved? Well, someone once said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We really tried to help them understand if the roots of some of the health risk behaviors that adults in our primary care network engage in are rooted in childhood experience of trauma, and we give them the opportunity to share that with us. It gives us a fuller picture of their health and an opportunity to intervene. Really quickly, I'm going to tell you, we had one of our site managers who once said to me, Dr. Briggs, I felt so bad 
this patient came in and we gave her an ACE screening and she was just coming in for a physical and she left needing therapy. And I said, I want you to turn that around. If she just came in for a physical and she left needing treatment for some other illness, would you feel bad? Absolutely not. You uncovered what was really going on for her. So we just shared with our, our staff, we said sometimes this work is amazing, it's rewarding. And sometimes the expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it because we're somehow immune to it is as unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet. We get drenched and it's exhausting. It's the price of walking through the rain. If you care, you're gonna get wet. You're gonna get some trauma on you. And that's where trauma-informed care came in to really help them manage it. So finally, we developed this critical incident management team. Um, this is work developed by Jeffrey Mitchell at the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation. <clears throat> it's an evidence-based practice model, and it's really been designed to help individuals exposed to work-related critical incidents, and it's been shown to prevent post-traumatic stress. After a lot of discussion, we decided that certain things, certain events would activate our SIM team and you see them here. Our SIM team is, um, are, is comprised of psychologists and social workers who went through a two-day training and then get ongoing training in order to really do this work. And they do a small group um, crisis management briefing, really this rest information transition service, it's like you know 10 minutes, 20 minutes for food. They're diffusing, right, they're debriefing and then they're following up um, a couple months later. So I just want to end by saying these are some of our lessons learned. We had to create a shared language. What are triggers? What is vicarious traumatization? We have an enormous institution and we had very diffused reporting structures. What do I mean by that? Well, I've been at Montefiore for almost, uh, you know, I don't know, 13 or so years. I didn't know that some of our security guards report up to our site managers and some are outside contractors. And it was really difficult to get the ones that were outside contractors into our training, for example. The IT, the IT infrastructure was really challenging, but I think it was critical, again, to have these multiple platforms where people could learn. ACE screening across the lifespan has been a heavy lift. I'm happy to talk about it more because I'm sure people have questions about it. We learned a lot of lessons about how to frame it. And then really just reminding ourselves of the importance of finding champions at every level. I love that Ken mentioned that one of his champions came from, um, came from the housekeeping service. So with that, I just want to say what can you do, you know, not even tomorrow, why wait, you know, this afternoon? Reflect on the importance of this work, commit to the change, and find your champions, and then it follows from there. So with that, I will uh, take your questions. Thanks so much, Rahel. That was an excellent presentation, tons of great information about the important work that you guys are doing at Montefiore. Um, so we have a number of questions. I'll start out by asking, um, how did you select the questions slash topics for the learning collaboratives? Um, and in just a, if I could do a second part to that, can you talk about how those efforts were sustained after the learning collaborative sessions in, the, in terms of like follow-up trainings or kind of keeping the momentum going? Sure, so thanks. The first question is how did we select these topics? As I said, we have a large integrated behavioral health staff and they'd been treating trauma and training on trauma for a long time. And when we looked at the trauma literature, this felt like the most relevant group of topics for our service providers. They didn't need to learn how to treat trauma. They just learned how, needed to learn how to recognize it. They needed to have a shared language. And we really needed to, quite frankly, hit them over the head with the fact that they could get water on them, right? Because they're walking through the rain and they were going to get wet. But it felt like a, an important building of the foundation first, so we were all speaking the same language, we knew what was going on, and then moving into what they could do about it. In terms of sustainability, 
these uh, online modules that we created, the nice thing about them is that whenever you get a new staff member who joins your system, like, you know, I'm sure, I don't know what keeps Ken up at night, I bet he sleeps pretty well, but, you know, you train these 5,000 people and then what happens when you hire a bunch of new people and how do you remember who's been trained and who hasn't been trained and what if your training changes, right? So having that online platform is a way to make sure that we plug those holes so to speak. And then really, now that we hopefully have a trauma-informed care workforce at every level, with every new initiative that comes down, right, we are a system of constant initiatives, just like Ken, whether they come from the federal or the, or the state or the city or ourselves, we always make sure there's a, there's a trauma-informed care person who can say, well, wait, you know, how, how can we bring that trauma-informed care lens to that new initiative? So even if it's something as simple as, um, I don't know, how about enrolling patients into the electronic medical record messaging system, right? Well, how can we bring a trauma-informed care lens to that work? What might be difficult about it? What might be easy about it? How do we make sure we're asking patients why they didn't enroll in a way that's not blaming? How do we make sure we understand their experience with the system, et cetera, et cetera? Thank you, Rahel. Um, similar to uh, during Ken's presentation, we've gotten a number of questions on uh, outcome evaluation. Can you talk a little bit about how you might have evaluated your training efforts, both in terms of um, the uptake side and then if you've done any evaluation on kind of the productivity and quality of service, services provided by clinicians after receiving training? Yes, so at the most basic level, we just wanted to know of all those people, our, our online learning system allows us to know who completed it and who didn't, and we can look at that by role. So we're constantly looking at those metrics, right? Our in-person trainings, we're making sure who came, who didn't, and how can we follow up. We did sort of in the moment and quality improvement on those in-person trainings. We started out doing them um, for everybody at the practice and then we heard very clearly that some folks needed a different level than other folks and so we sort of threw a lot more in for uh, maybe a lot more of the brain science in for the physicians and the nurses and the front desk staff told us that's important and we like that stuff but we need a lot more like actual strategies in terms of working in the front desk and how to work with patients. Um, in terms of actually looking at the effectiveness of this, like I mentioned, we have a team of volunteer research assistants who go out into our practices, embed themselves into the waiting rooms, and they're asking patients about their experience of our care. Because I think that, you know, we can, we can ask ourselves all we want how trauma-informed we are, but the, the end goal of this is that the patients experience our system as a more trauma-informed system. And so we have these research assistants who go in and ask patients about their experience relevant to our trauma-informed care provision. They do that in an ongoing way. Thanks so much, Rahel. Um, kind of shifting gears a bit towards um, some more of the clinical piece, folks have been asking about how you go about screening the adult population for ACEs and then what referral processes are in place for patients who have a high ACE score. I would just ask you if you could touch on um, physician apprehensive, physician apprehension to screening, if you could, please. Sure. So, actually, for us, believe it or not, the easy part is the second part of that question. So, what referral mechanisms are in place? Like I said, we have social workers, psychologists, and psychiatrists on site working alongside the physicians, so that was no problem. And we oftentimes would find that. The best way to manage that apprehension that you're mentioning, Chris, and that we would talk to you about throughout the life of this grant is um, to face it head on, quite frankly. And we found that folks were very anxious about asking adults about their childhood trauma. So we asked our patient advisory committee to weigh in on that. And we went so far as to videotape them. 
sort of pleading with their doctors, pleading with their doctors, excuse me, to ask them these questions. And they said things like, this is what's making me sick, and I don't know why you won't ask me about this. And what we learned over and over again is I think sometimes we, you know, we overly baby our patients and we say, oh, no, that's too intrusive and we can't ask patients that. And the patients were saying, please ask me this. This is what's making me sick. When we had folks, to, providers who are really resistant, you know, just start small and start with your low-hanging fruit. If there's one provider in your clinic who's a little bit interested in this, say to her, what would you think if on the days that the social worker has flexible time for warm handoffs, she's not booked with patients, that those days you do the ACEs screening. The social worker will stand outside the exam room. She won't be in a meeting. She won't be somewhere else. She's going to stand outside that exam room. Would that help you to feel like you could maybe ask these questions? And so really starting small, providing that patient voice over and over again of how much they wanted these questions to get asked and making sure you had on-site resources. Thanks so much, Rahel. Unfortunately, we are just about out of time. Um, so I wanted to say thank you to Rahel once again and also to thank, thank you to all of our participants for another great set of questions. Um, of course, we got way more questions today than, than we were able to get to, so we are going to do our best to get answers to those questions and get them posted on our website, which we're still in the process of doing from our first webinar uh, a few weeks back as well, but those will be up soon in addition to today's. Uh, before we close, I'd like to invite everyone to visit chcs.org backslash trauma-informed care to learn more about the Advancing Trauma-Informed Care Initiative, to download practical resources for adopting trauma-informed approaches to care, and also, of course, to subscribe to CHCS's email and social media updates to learn about new programs and resources. So once again, a huge thank you to Ken and Rahel for their great presentations today. Thank you to all of our participants for joining us today and posing so many thoughtful questions. So we really appreciate it, and have a great rest of the day, everyone.